Flex Report. Paul, KB5MU, Bob, N4HY, and myself traveled to Austin, Texas to meet with Steve and Gerald at Flex Radio Systems on 22nd through the 23rd of February 2016. A manufactured radio is one of the solutions that Phase 4 Ground will develop in support of Phase 4B payload, Phase 3E payload, Cube Quest Challenge, Terrestrial Ground Sats, and future payloads. Flex Radio, as a leading manufacturer of ham radio SDR equipment, approached AMSAT about the possibility of manufacturing Phase 4 Ground radios. Steve and Gerald and many others at Flex were extremely generous with their time and advice. We talked about a variety of subjects relating to Phase 4 Ground. We introduced the project, showed block diagrams, discussed engineering philosophy and expectations, and shared context. There were results. Phase 4 Ground asked Flex to build a small quantity, 25, of development boards based on existing technology from Flex products. These boards will provide enough Flex-centric hardware in order for us to advance down the path of a manufactured solution for Phase 4 Ground. The build is pending the release of private funding. Efforts will be expended to align the Flex hardware builds with another larger order from another organization that requires nearly identical hardware. Coordination of this type greatly reduces risk and cost. There will be some number of these boards available to Phase 4 ground developers. We will have a document that will track interest in and possession of the boards so that everyone can see who has them and what they're doing with them. The meetings at Flex concluded with a resolution to support the Phase 5B Mars mission. One of the topics discussed during the Flex meetings was our dual band feed effort. Having a single antenna was considered by Flex to be a very important requirement, especially for the emergency communications market. There are recognized difficulties with a dual band feed for the frequencies and power levels under consideration. This is an area of active research in Phase 4 ground, with the challenges being much better described and explained over the past week or so. Here's an image that might serve to show more clearly what we are concerned about. The purple X is the downlink. The blue asterisk is the second harmonic of the uplink. The green triangles are the working limits of the receive LNB we expect to be using. You can see that the second harmonic of the uplink falls within the receive range of the LNB. You can see that selecting different local oscillators doesn't really help. You can see that moving to a different 5 GHz subband doesn't really help and would require some politicking. So in order to achieve our goal of having a single antenna solution, we have to confront this signal and we have to reduce it as much as possible. Why do we care so much about something like a dual band feed? Because based on market research and professional feedback, we must do our best to provide a single dish solution. A dual band feed is one way to achieve this. It's not the only way, as Kent WA5VJB is working on a patch plus dish design, and I think several of us are thinking about some expensive phased array techniques. If you have another idea, share it. Kent believes that 120 decibels of isolation would be required in order to declare success, and that a low-pass filter at the uplink PA was an obvious part of the solution. Flex Radio advised looking into a push-pull amplifier, as this would greatly reduce the second harmonic from the get-go. We have the uplink linear polarization orthogonal to the downlink linear polarization. There is some isolation from that. Bill Werner, W3EAO, proposes an uplink RF chain. He recommends a power amp by Cree, which produces 10 watts at 6 centimeters, so you're at plus 40 dBm, with the second harmonic expected to be down 20 dB at plus 20 dBm. This feeds a pair of mini circuits LFCN722 low pass filters, 1.5 dB at 6 centimeters, 38 dB at 3 centimeters. 3 centimeters would now be at negative 55 dBm, 6, centim 6 centimeters at 5 watts. This goes to a directive systems dual band feed, the WB5LAU design, with 70 dB isolation between 6 cm and 3 cm ports. Second harmonic is now at negative 85, 6 cm now at negative 33. Then use a mini circuits filter from feed to the 3 cm preamp. The insertion loss is 0.24 dB and 6 cm rejection of an additional 52 dB, which puts both the 5.6 GHz and its second harmonic at negative 85 dBm into the 10 gig preamp. He judges this to be close enough. He writes, this design, while not cheap, does give a 5 watt, 5.6 gig transmitter, should be more than enough, using a single dish. The use of cross polarization should give an another 10 to 20 dB. Also, you need to evaluate why the 10 gig preamp has such limited dynamic range. Kerry Banke in 6IZW shared some progress on the dual band feed effort. He also is working on recruiting additional 
uh, person who has expertise in this particular area. If successful, then that would bring the number of people working on the several solutions for single dish design to five. With Paul Wade, Whiskey One Gigahertz also working on a dual band feed design of his own. Not bad, but there's still room for more. Paul Wade says to hang in there. He's working on it and we'll report back soon. Carrie Banky writes, I ran a test using your LNB to see at what input level in the uh, 11.35 megahertz, uh, gigahertz range, sorry, 11,350 megahertz range, the 10,450 megahertz starts being affected. It looks like we need to have the PA second harmonic less than about negative 70 dBm at the LNB input. I'm thinking I'll build one of Al Ward's dual band feeds to get some firsthand experience with the isolation subject. My general leaning at this point is to see if a circular waveguide bandpass filter can be built into the rear section or tube of the 10 gig portion of the feed and then cut the horn off an LMB and directly attach the circular LMB guide to the filter output of the feed. I'll also look at a low pass filter for the transmit PA to reduce the second harmonic. I will need to dig through my stuff to see how much power I can generate at 5 gig. I suspect 5 gig TWT amps can be had for testing. And that closes Carrie Banky's quote. Carrie is thinking maybe a low pass filter for the PA and low loss band pass waveguide filter at the LNB input. One of his thoughts is to see if a waveguide post band pass filter uh, for 10.45 gig can be designed out of three quarter inch inner diameter copper pipe as part of the dual band feed to reject the uh, second harmonic. There is always the baseline design of two dishes with two separate feeds. Think of two dishes as the stacked high frequency monobander approach. You can always do this. John Klingenhofer, Howie DeFelice, Bill Werner, and several others provided substantial feedback uh, on all of these uh, designs and ideas midweek. They raised the possibility of gating the transmitter off during receive and discussed some numbers to back up this approach. The system is defined as full duplex, but this strategy needs to be kept in mind if we cannot achieve our goal any other way. If you have another solution that you don't see mentioned here or any feedback at all about any of this, then we are very interested in it. We welcome experimentation, comment, and critique. Next up was uh, codec quality. John, WB4LNM, brought up something that a lot of us very strongly agree with. Digital systems, not just amateur ones, but commercial ones as well, have been plagued with really crappy codecs. Voice compression allows more money to be made. Therefore, compressing to the point of pain is worth doing. We do not want crappy voice quality. John interviewed the two codecs we're most interested in using on phase four and provided valuable feedback on what he thought was acceptable quality. These two codecs are codec two and opus. Next up is the air interface. Discussion continued and expanded on how to achieve adaptive coding and modulation for phase four ground. There are a lot of questions to consider, progress made and content being collected for revising the air interface document. There are some ideas that have endured for months and some that are shifting. A general worthy goal in this area is to reduce the required state in the satellite to zero whenever possible. In other words, the preference is that no user state is stored on the satellite. This reduces the complexity of the satellite code. This is highly desirable. This also means the satellite functions are much more scalable. This makes the radios on the ground much simpler as well because they do not have to deal with a complicated satellite. So, where do you pay for all this simplicity? Well, you pay in two ways. Each frame must be able to fully explain itself. There is increased overhead in every transmission. This overhead is what would otherwise be stored in a connection object or memory bank or register or whatever in the satellite. When you say you don't want to do that, then you as a frame or packet have to always be ready to present proper state or allow the state to be calculated at any time. In other words, system complexity is reduced because we purchase the simplicity with additional overhead and quite possibly a more complex protocol. Another very large factor in our protocol is that our hardware is not fixed. The protocol must be adapted to intelligently handle any reasonable combination of uplink and downlink capability, and it must be able to do this without burdening the satellite hardware. If the hardware was fixed, then some of what we're talking about doing would not be necessary because one could make assumptions about the ground. Providing this adaptive capability is a challenge, but it's definitely achievable. Next up is RF knock feedback. John Petrick, W7FU, had some questions and comments about uh, last week's RF knock report. 
He asks just what part or parts of the phase four and maybe other phase programs communication systems are you considering using the RFNAC technology with? Okay, so what parts specifically would we be looking at? Well, any part that seems like it can be moved to the FPGA from the general purpose processor would be up for grabs as an RFNOC implementation. This requires us to define the division of labor between the host or general purpose processor and the FPGA. We're making progress in this direction, but until we get a flow graph that at least sort of works, we won't know exactly what should be done by RFNOC, if anything. John explains that his attitude towards RFNOC and similar attempts by amateurs tends to be negative. He is concerned that committing too much of the program to advanced FPGA technology is a losing proposition when there is a launch deadline pending. He had the following reasons. One, Edis is struggling to get RFNOC going smoothly. The Discuss USRP Digest is dominated by X310 RFNOC questions. Two, SDR stick people affiliated with Tapper have a product and plan to implement an FPGA product. Their SDR stick digest is totally consumed by the struggles to get the SDR front end connected to the FP FPGA module up and running. Also, they were faced with an 18 month delay at delivery of the promised FPGA that they had committed to using. Three, and uh, John wonders, without any information, how much of the long delay that Flex Radio experienced at releasing their new 6000 series SDRs was because of FPGA issues product delivery delays, programming challenges, etc. So these reasons are very compelling. When we talk about RF knock and say that it's developmental and that people are literally circling the watering hole waiting for fresh meat to dive in and take the first and biggest risks, then you should get the idea that RF knock really is kind of out there. If you weren't already all full up of risk just by working on a space project, then adding in RF knock would certainly fully subscribe you to the same category of people that jump out of perfectly good airplanes. So we will keep talking about this, and I will keep talking to people involved with RFNOC. If it becomes obvious that it's worth the risk, the learning curve, and the processing and efficiency gains, or if our project somehow gets chosen as a test case and fully supported, then it might be worth going all in. For now, this qualifies as something for our R&D and long-range planning departments. John also ran into difficulty using the GNU Radio DVBS flow graph on a USRP B100. The USB 2 data link will not support the 10 mega samples per second in the DVBS transmitter flow graph. At least it didn't for him. The DVBS flow graph runs perfectly on USRPs with either USB 3, like the X310, or Ethernet data links. But on a B100 USRP, which is pretty much the same as the HackRF interface, it, the flow graph produced massive overruns and froze up in short order. He caused a force quit error. So heads up, Team Hacker F, let us know if this concern is something uh, real, that you're seeing these problems, and we'll do what we can. All right, so next up, equipment has been deployed on Palomar Mountain at the uh, a prototype site. So over the weekend, Paul, KB5, MU, and I set up a 2.4 gig and 5 gig end of the link to do demonstrations between Lake Dixon and Palomar Mountain. The prototype site provides a much smaller off-mountain window, even with some chainsawing. This photo is for Steve, and uh, this map is for Steve. Check out those squiggles. We confirmed being able to remote into the Raspberry Pi running the show uh, in the experiment, and we can reach the Ubiquity bullets through this connection as well. We now need equipment on the other end to go live. That would be the Lake Dixon end. The equipment is pointed sort of kind of towards Dixon, but will be moved to the better site uh, as soon as we can. Okay. I saw we had some tire apps and tape. Mm -hmm. We sure do. Let's uh, give those cables another tie down. All right, we have kind of a skinny view, even after I cut down the trees, but we are pointed towards Dixon, towards KA9Q, towards uh, Carmel Valley where I live. All of that stuff is in this general area. So this is not the final destination for this equipment. The other site is about a mile to, uh, to our right and is way better. However, this is a house with power and all that and uh, you know we can 
at least make sure that we can remote into this system and uh, do some experiments. The better site is at the Palomar Amateur Radio Club uh, repeater site. And it provides uh, azimuth of 200 degrees to 245 degrees. That's a whole lot more than what we have uh, at this particular place where the uh, equipment was set up. We did determine exactly where we want to put the antennas and the equipment box um, at the Palomar club site. We're going to bring this up at the board meeting this coming Wednesday and ask permission to go ahead and install. Uh, but in the meantime, there's working equipment um, on the mountain. Management. Okay. We added many new volunteers this week, and they possess a diverse array of skills and experiences. It's been suggested that we develop a directory for the project volunteers. AMSAT does not publish a list of volunteers, but does publish a directory of the points of contact for major areas of activity. It would seem like it would obviously help people to better find each other if we published a directory, but as an open source and open process project, volunteer contact information really must be opt-in. I believe that you can log in to the Mailman account page for Phase 4 and get a list of fellow subscribers. But a list of email addresses did not provide the sort of introduction that makes it easy to start working with each other. If you have ideas or suggestions for improvement in this area, then please share them. Making this an easy, enjoyable, and supported experience is my goal. We also need um, a more formal process for delegating technical work. Up until this past week or two, it's been mostly possible to do it through email. However, we are ramping up and we need processes that support you all being able to better participate in the work. This means something like a Google form or a spreadsheet in GitHub or something else. I need some suggestions here on how to best delegate work to the team and also make it easy to report back and document. So let me know. These are not easy problems to solve, as I'm sure each of you already fully know. I will do my best to make it easy and enjoyable to be a technical volunteer for AMSET, and finding out what work needs to be done is almost the most important thing in making forward progress.